Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the dawn of this new day that you've given us. And every time we come to church, there's an opportunity for a fresh and a new beginning. Lord, we just yield our hearts before you this morning. And we come with open eyes and ears that we might see and hear the revelations that we receive from this holy book. Lord, you've left us your word, it's truth, it's life to all who find it. And as we reflect upon our life, we can say with a surety that your word has found us. And it's caused us to fall in love with you. Blessed Holy Spirit, we ask that you strengthen our walk this morning. That you introduce us to a portion of you that we may have not have pondered in some time. That our love for you might grow and our relationship with you might continue to be strengthened by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just one passage of verse this morning. I'll be reading from the Gospel of Mark. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to read along with me from chapter 3. Verse 3, just the last two words. Mark 3, verse 3. Stand up. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. An instruction from Christ this morning. Stand up. What are we to make of this? Here we find Jesus in this passage of verse teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And there was a man there with a withered hand. The Pharisees were there too. And these whited sepulchers, they set their eyes upon Jesus without any thoughts for their empty heart seeking to trip him up. Jesus gave them exactly what they were waiting for. He instructed this man who came with a withered hand to stand. And in a moment of time, he healed the infirmity as he stood. Let us consider this great miracle this morning as it relates to each one of us. First, I want to challenge us this morning to focus on our unnecessary petitions rather than our unanswered petitions. Think about that for a moment. We often come to church in a segment of our prayer is petitioning God for what we want, what we need, what we lack. How many times in our petitions do we fail to thank Him for what we have, what He's given us, what He's provided? Our thoughts of thanksgiving are still fresh upon our minds. We went around the table with my family and each one of us took turns thanking God for what we have, what He's done. In light of this morning's verse, I'd like to add another thing that we should be thankful for. And that is the pain that led us in our life to find Jesus. I can remember quite vividly in a pew just like this. As a young teenager and in my early 20s coming to church. And during those years of my life when I was still finding myself, still growing and maturing spiritually, many of the times that I came to church, I came with a great deal of pain. I can remember during the praise and worship, waiting for the praise to give way to worship, genuflected in my heart before the king. Pouring out my heart before him solemnly in my church pew. My eyes closed. My heart fixed upon Jesus. I couldn't wait. Until the music began to race and the choir began to sing more loudly. I opened my eyes to look and see if anybody else was standing yet. I could not wait to leap to my feet and praise the Lord. Have you ever experienced a heart of worship that captivates your whole body that you can't just stay, sit any longer. Like this withered man, you must be obedient to the voice of God that's speaking to your heart. Stand. 
I was longing for a touch from the Holy Spirit of God. I remember, like the psalmist says, feeling in my soul like a dry, weary land without water, knowing desperately that the only one that could touch my withered heart was Jesus. Pain led me to church. And there was something within myself. Perhaps it was a prior touch or a testimony or seeing the multitudes of people come forward and kneel at the altar at a Billy Graham crusade. I knew that my remedy could be found in Christ and in Christ alone. And it was times like this in my life and many more where the Holy Spirit was teaching me where to find Him. God inhabits the praises of His people. As I matured, I no longer came to God's house petitioning Him for what I needed or what I wanted. Notice the great transition that took place in this man in a short interval of time. He came to the synagogue with his heart focused on his hand, hearing the reputation of Christ that was spread throughout the land, believing that Christ could heal him, but just being in the presence of God matured him in such a way that he no longer thought about his hand when Christ instructed him to stand. He stood. He could have said, but Lord, don't you see this hand, this infirmed hand that I'd like to raise to praise you? Your mind being focused on the wrong part of me, my feet are perfectly well. Have we ever experienced this in our own lives? Coming to church week after week after week with the same infirmity of body, the same broken heart, the same sick soul, and yet, how often we fail to acknowledge that we have feet to get us here in the first place. And every week as I look around the church, I praise God because I know it's difficult for many of you to come. Because your feet hurt, your knees hurt, you're walking with the assistance of a walker, but there's something within your soul because of experiences with God in yesteryears that instructs you it's good, it's very good to be here. Our pain leads us oftentimes to the cross. And that's why you hear me reflecting upon the right thief in many of my sermons because he's so relatable to me. One who is filled with the agony of crucifixion himself knowing that he was a sinner and deserved to die. And yet, in his last moments of his life, what did this crucified criminal do? He stood for Christ. We deserve to be here, but this righteous man has done nothing wrong. However heinous our sins may be, whatever horrible lives we have lived, if we stand for Christ, if we only have one breath to breathe, then let us stand today. You will be with me in paradise. When I was a young man and could not bring myself to church, I remember my mom putting us in an Uber driver's car or a taxi driver or a jitney, they were called in those days, to get us to church. I didn't know why we were going to the prayer meeting. We used to sit on the steps because many times we'd get there when it was almost over. But still enough time to hear the word. Still enough time to be in the presence of God and feed on the gospel. 
And some of those gospel teachings that I received in my very tender years were influential in my latter years. But do you know what thrusted us onward to church? Paying for a taxi when we couldn't afford groceries? The pain in my mother's life. She struggled with depression her whole life and still does. Pain led her to church. And I was a benefactor of my mother's pain. But now we're preaching the gospel. Because what, are we dis what we're discussing here, if your spirit is listening and if your soul is being enlarged, is a lesson about the cross of Jesus Christ. Lest we forget the pain that he was experiencing on the tree. Why was this righteous man who was teaching in a synagogue, healing this man with a withered hand, who had done nothing wrong and committed no sin, though the high priests and Pilate inspected him, finding no spot and blemish, why crucified there on the cross for pain? Whose pain? For our pain. Lest we forget the message of the gospel, the golden thread that is woven from Genesis onward through Revelation. He is the propitiation for our sins. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were punished. Being dismissed from the garden. But they were not punished for the second death. The second death, which is the wrath of God, would have befallen them and all the sons of Adam, including you and I, but for the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the flogging, the torturing that our Savior endured, the nails that were plowed through His hands and His feet, the crown of thorns upon his head. Isaiah the prophet said there was never a man more disfigured. They reeled accusations against him. They abused him. They spat on him. They plucked his beard and punched his beautiful face. What is the personification of his outward visage? The pain that sin has caused the world. The pain that sin causes mankind. The pain that sin caused me. That caused you. The pain that you see causing, that sin causes your loved ones. Your children who are wayward. The pain that this community is experiencing. And even the ones that sat with us at supper at Thanksgiving because they have not Christ. Some of them being yet in ignorance. But beloved, there's a remedy for this pain. And I prayerfully petition God for all the people that He's bringing to mind right now that are still experiencing the pain of sin. And I pray that that pain becomes so severe in this life that it leads them to the cross. Do we not have another Reason to be thankful during this season for the pain, be it my own pain or my mother's or yours or your grandparents that led you to receive Christ? Is that not why we diligently instruct our children? I just had a conversation this week with my son reminding him, son, you cannot ride into heaven on the coattails of your mother nor your father or none of your pappy. You must have your own relationship with Christ. And you're 13 now. During these next five years, you'll be tested by the world and the temptations and the lusts of the flesh. Darkness is swirling all around you. Resist it. Why do I preach to my children in this manner? That they might be spared the same pain that I experienced. 
while I was yet off sinning in the world. The sooner that we meet Christ, the sooner that we put sin under feet and are washed in the blood of Christ, we can be healing can begin to take place in our soul. I thank God this morning for the pain that led me to receive Christ because but for that pain, I might have never received it. Pain led this withered hand man to listen and hear Jesus but he learned another valuable lesson I've already touched upon this Christ could have healed this man very easily miracles are easy for Jesus for us who have been to the doctor speaking of physical healings they seem like a tremendous feat but the gospel records in many places, how easy it is for Jesus to open the blind eye, the deaf ear. It was easy for Jesus to call Lazarus forth from the tomb to be raised. Easy for the woman who had the issue of blood who touched the hem of his garment to be cleansed. Why would Jesus make this man wait for his hand to be healed? But let me make this question more personal. Why does he make us wait even many days and many years before our petition is answered? Doesn't it seem counterintuitive? If we are his people and he is our God, if our hairs are numbered, our tears bottled up, he knows our cares and our anxieties, then surely he knows our pain. Could it be that for some of us our pain Keeps us close to Him. How many can attest? If I was healed straightway, I would have never come back to church. It was the pain that continued during my life that maintained a longing to receive from Christ. But I believe that there's another reason. Do you see the loving kindness in this verse? God asked the man to stand, and he stood. What was he teaching him by that simple instruction? He was teaching him an awful lot about his divinity, wasn't he? You are man, and I am God, and I have power to heal you, and I can, but I will heal you when I want to heal you, According to when I see the timing is right. And so right now I'm just asking you to stand. What a beautiful position. This withered man occupied. Because when I read the scriptures it said that Jesus entered the synagogue. And I would envision that there were two people standing for sure. Though there could have been more. And that was Jesus and the withered man. Have you ever thought that enduring through your infirmity and persisting onward brings Jesus good pleasure? That it puts a smile upon his face? That he delights in people who are dealing with a great infirmity in their life, but refuse to blame God for anything. Standing with Him. Enduring with Him. How the saints of old have left great examples before us. When I read it in the Gospels about Paul being shipwrecked and stoned, and yet he pressed onward toward the high calling that was his inheritance through Christ. Enduring with him. How many come to church for only what they can get. Not for what God has already done. But if we are to grow and be mature. Let us stand with him despite the difficulties that we may be experiencing in our life. 
even, even if we remain with it. Our healing will come. Our deliverance will come. Salvation will come. But are we willing to stand with him while we are yet waiting for the great miracle to take place? And then one last thought this morning. <clears throat> My mind found it. My last thought this morning is something that I believe is often overlooked in the body of Christ. Because whether or not we want to acknowledge it, Christians can sometimes occupy the position of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We can be self-righteous in our faith. And, and I've seen this many times during my time in church. A false sense of security gained by our occupation in our church pews and people walking into church who are still like this withered man waiting for their infirmity to be cleansed. Let us never look down our nose at such as these. I recall a conversation with a friend who was speaking of one of our mutual friends who was still struggling very much with addiction. And that person that was still in addiction would give testimony to the goodness of God. It sounds like a contradiction. A Pharisee might say, sinner, why are you, why are you praising God and yet still in bondage? Why are you still raising your hand in praise that I see your life being very much in trap? But is that not the testimony of this withered man who was standing with Christ while yet withered? My testimony, personally, is like his. When I was still struggling with the world, struggling with sin, struggling with nonsense, there was something within my soul that prompted me onward toward God. Is there one here who is still yet infirmed but is making their way to Christ? Don't let the righteous people deter you from receiving what Christ would have for you, but press onward. And is there someone that the Holy Ghost is bringing to our minds during this Thanksgiving season who is, needs to be encouraged to keep pressing toward Christ that they might receive deliverance Healing, salvation, be made whole through the power of His blood? And is there one here who has not yet stood? You know, there are two types of people, spiritually, that need to be strengthened. And I wrote this down because it's a tongue twister. And I pray that neither, none of us, can identify with either one of these designations. We must not be private Christians with public sins. In other words, we must not come to church privately, but then be out in the world living recklessly. Nor must we be public Christians with private sins. In other words, we must not proclaim our Christianity openly, but within our heart still be struggling with the sin nature if we are to be conformed into the image of Christ. Is there one here as we close that needs to stand for Christ as this withered, withered hand man was? Sometimes we can be so fixated on our problems that we miss the easy solution. This man may have come come to church fixated on his hand, but when he forgot about that and set his heart upon Jesus, he was healed straightway. And he left with the knowledge 
that God is God, and He will bring us along our lives according to His divine purpose. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, You're good. Your mercy, the Bible says, it endures forever. Lord, I pray that the word that has gone forth may be planted as a seed in the hearts of your people. Some of us may have been distracted by silly and nonsensical things by our own accord or just because of our human nature. Lord, we pray that your power would overcome, that your word would just penetrate our souls in a mighty and a powerful way. This man came to church with her, but he left being made whole. Lord, we've come with many different petitions, but the longing and desire of our heart that is common among us is that we need more of Jesus. Help us to stand boldly in this dark hour that is all around us, that others might look upon us and see the light of Christ. And if there be one here, or in the sound of my voice, who has come to church feeling very weak, spiritually lost, broken hearted. Dear friend, pain has led you to a place in your life to understand spiritually that you need Jesus. The Bible says that he came to this world for one reason. To prove how much he loves you. And that love was proven when Christ mounted a cross and died in your place. He endured the pain that should have befallen you. That you might receive eternal life and forgiveness through his precious blood. If you've never repented before the cross, I ask you now to repent of your sins before the one who is able and just to forgive you. The Bible says, though our sins are as scarlet, He makes them white like the pure driven snow. I pray with that one, Lord, and I ask that you wash them clean with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Friend, won't you invite Him into your heart right now to be your Savior, your Lord, and your King? The Bible says He will never leave you he will never forsake you always to the end of the world. Lord, we thank you for your presence here this morning. The steadfastness of your people who long for more of you. And we ask that you would remain with us during this Advent season as we again remember the precious night when the Savior of the world was born in Bethlehem. Lord, if you would not have been born, we could never be reborn into the kingdom. And so for this, we too thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.